finally, the play action has come back to the Atlanta Falcons offense. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. So guys, if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black, a.k.a. Mr. AKA, and I've been covering the Atlanta Falcons for a very long time, formerly at Falcfans.com. RIP, still going strong on this illustrious podcast. And I thank each and every one of you that go strong with me as everydayers. That means you make it your first listen or first watch each and every day. And all you got to do is become an everyday or subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So today's episode is an all 22 review. We'll be breaking down the film from week two's win over the Philadelphia Eagles. We'll be talking a lot about the run game and play action passing and why the Falcons' run game click, why their run defense didn't click. And if you happen to be a Locked On Falcons insider, you not only will be able to hear all the things that I'm talking about today, but you actually get to see examples of all the various things that I'm talking about today. And so if you want to be a Locked On Falcons insider, you're more of a visual learner than an audio learner. All you got to do is click that link in the description below at joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Falcons. You'll be able to get access to all the extended all 22 reviews that I have done, all the off-season in insight that I've shared, you know, breakdowns of the free agents, all that stuff and more. It's all available for you there. Uh, just click that link in the description below. And guess what? You get a 14-day free trial. So you can try it for the next two weeks for free. See if you like it. Keep it at that point. Pay $4.99 a month or you can drop it and, you know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll still be good. You, you could still be in every day of this podcast uh, without being a Lockdown Falcons insider. But you also get priority on, you know, upcoming Q&As that we probably will have at some point later this year. But Let's talk first about the improved play calling from Zach Robinson. And to me, the biggest catalyst for that was the incorporation of some play action passing. It sort of killed the narrative that, hey, Kirk's health was the thing that was holding the team back, cementing my narrative, my agenda, that week one was more about Zach Robinson and less about Kirk Cousins than necessarily the national media and elsewhere were talking about. But we saw the Falcons using play action on about 26% of their dropbacks, eight out of 31. That was the 10th highest in the NFL in week two. Cousins was five for eight for 53 yards on those plays. And there were more opportunities for the Falcons, at least based off of the design of the plays. It's just a little couple of things that the Falcons didn't quite execute. You had that sort of missed one that I think the, the first one was a batted pass, right? Uh, that first play action concept on that opening drive. And then on the second series, I think it was, or maybe it was later in that same series, but some, at some point in the first quarter, um, the Falcons hit that uh, play action pass to Drake London for 19 yards. But the replay, if you saw it, you know, you saw Ray Ray McLeod streaking down the field and that was, you know, you can criticize Kirk for not seeing that, but you know, uh, I don't, I would, I don't think that's a fair criticism because the design of that play was meant to go to Drake London. And basically if, if Kirk, read that play as he did, he would have assumed it was cover three and it was cover three. And therefore someone would have picked up Ray McLeod for the deep third, but Darius Slay blew his coverage on that play. And so not being able to see that in the spur of the moment, I don't think is really Kirk Cousins' fault, but you had a couple of other potential more opportunities uh, for big plays for Drake London and Kyle Pitts, but pressure kind of disrupted those plays. And then of course, at the end of the game, you had Darnell Mooney stopping his route on that sort of corner route where Kirk seemingly threw a great ball on that one. That could have been a big play uh, that could have sparked the Falcons come back earlier in the game than what it wound up being. And, and so we didn't have to necessarily sweat out those last, you know, 99 seconds as we did. But, you know, I think the opportunities were there. It was big improvement, I think, for Zach Robinson. And I think we'll get to see how much more improvement Zach Robinson can make uh, in the coming weeks because he's going to be tested by a bunch of really good defensive play callers and some solid defenses, right? You have Steve Spagnuolo this week, arguably the best de defensive coordinator in the NFL today. You have Dennis Allen coming after that week. We know New Orleans' defense is always sound. Uh, Todd Bowles the week after that. You have Carolina, Ajiro Evero. I know their defense hasn't looked good this year, but you know similar defensive style to what the Falcons are playing. You have Mike McDonald after that, then Bowles again, Mike Zimmer, uh, Dennis Allen. So, you know, to me, these next 
two months, basically, these next eight games, we're going to really learn a lot more about Zach, uh, Zach Robinson, I'm sorry, and sort of that chess match that him and these various defensive coaches, you're going to see defensive coaches adjusting a lot more to what the Falcons are doing. And can Zach Robinson continue to stay ahead of the curve and, and continue to challenge defenses and defensive coordinators uh, in that sort of chess match and whatnot. And so that's going to be a real big defining aspect of this upcoming season. And we'll get to learn a lot more about Zach Robinson as those defenses potentially make those adjustments and, and whether or not he can keep them guessing. But, you know, you're probably sitting there going, well, Aaron, he, he passed the test going up against one of the best defensive minds in football and Vic Fangio in Philadelphia on Monday night. And I'm going to push back a little bit because I, I don't think Vic Fangio is nearly as good as he is reputed to be as a defensive coordinator. I think that allows us to get into the conversation on how and why the Falcons were so effective running the football against the Eagles. And we'll break that down as we continue today's All-22 review. So, guys, you know, scheduling is always a hassle in today's modern, hectic world. And you're always running around doing stuff, you know, and you just want to get some food in your belly or food on the table or whatever. And that's where our friends DoorDash, your on-demand food delivery app, can deliver. And whether you're like me trying to feed yourself between podcasts as you, you know, coordinate multiple episodes in a day, uh, or you're just trying to get your favorite game day snacks food and beverages ready to go. DoorDash is there for you. All you got to do is download the DoorDash app to order your game day faves and use promo code LOCKEDFALL24 for 50% off up to a $10 value. And when you spend $15 or more on your first order, there's a limited time offer. Terms apply. Promo code is not valid for orders containing alcohol. DoorDash, your door to game day greatness, your door to more. Must be 21 or older to order Alcohol, drink responsibly, alcohol available only in select markets. And guys, I want to tell you about FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because now through September 22nd, just a couple of days left to take advantage of this great offer that FanDuel's throwing at you, where all FanDuel customers, all of you, all of you that are FanDuel customers can bet $5 and you'll get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. And then with that YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. And all you need is a Google account and a current form of payment. You can cancel anytime. Just visit FanDuel.com right now to download America's number one sports book. And while you're there, go check out the line for the upcoming week three action between the Falcons and Chiefs, where the Falcons are three and a half point underdogs. That line has moved in the Falcons' favor since the Monday night game from four and a half. So we'll see if it continues to move or, you know, where it goes. But go check it out at FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So talking about today's Locked on Falcons All-22 review, and, you know, if you want to talk about what's going on with the other all 32 NFL teams. Okay, bad segue, I know. But uh, check out Locked On NFL, the new look Locked On NFL, two shows daily, Tyler Roll and Tony Wiggins getting you covered for all the big stories going on around the NFL. It's all available on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So my spicy take is, and this has been the take of mine for like the last two years, and you know, I've, I've told it to people in the Locked On Falcons Discord, link in the description below if you want to join the conversation there. But uh, I, haven't, I haven't come out on the podcast and said it. Uh, so now, you know, I'll have all the, you know, defensive dude bros coming at me for this. But Vic Fangio is overrated, right? He has a quality scheme, but I don't think he's as good a defensive coordinator as he's often reputed to be. I think most of that is he's too married to his scheme. It's a good scheme, but like he, you know, it. I think as we saw on Monday night, it, it kind of failed him uh, in that regard. But, you know, we, we've seen overall the NFL teams adopting more of what we call the Fangio style of defense, which is, you know, a lot of two high safety looks rather than the one high safety looks that were very popular for the previous decade. Thanks to Pete Carroll and the Seattle Seahawks, the Falcons themselves were that type of team playing a lot of cover three and whatnot. And the the shift has mostly been with the idea of we're going to try to limit explosive plays, right? That's proven the point that I've, I've made many times on this podcast over the last decade that, you know, it's all about explosive plays and that's why the play action, you need play action in your offense in today's NFL to generate those explosive plays. But, you know, I think what that shift has done is it has made teams a lot more vulnerable to the run, right? Because the sort of classic Seahawks style cover three, you had that box safety, that Cam Chancellor, in the Falcons case, Keanu Neal, that was easy to add as an extra defender, in the box to defend the run. And, you know, 
Fangio is one of the innovators of the shift away from this style of defense. And again, I, I think his scheme, you know, on paper is sound. But my issue is he's too married to his scheme and not enough adjusting his scheme to his players. Uh, and that's to me why there was a kind of a revolt in Miami after last year and, and they ran him out of town. And I think that we'll, they'll probably run him out of town in Philadelphia after this year as well. Uh, because if you're going to play with light boxes, you know, a lot of teams play with light boxes, but you need bigger bodies up front to play with light boxes. And the Eagles don't really have that. And you contrast that with what Ryan Nielsen brought to Atlanta last year, who played, you know, similar, believed in similar, let's play a lot of two high looks, let's play with light boxes. But he compensated by adding bigger bodies up front. That's why you had Calais Campbell and Bud Dupree and, and Zach Harrison playing edge as opposed to interior uh, D-line. And so, you know, I, I think this kind of signals that, while Fangio's scheme sound on paper, there's a disconnect in Philadelphia between the front office with all the players that they went out and, and added this offseason because they got a whole lot of light guys, you know, to play out there on the edge, right? And when I see teams that successfully play with light boxes, it's usually because they don't not only have beef in the middle of their D-line, but they also have beef on the outside with like 270 plus pound edge rushers. And Philadelphia has Nolan Smith and Josh Sweat and Bryce Huff, right? And I think that's going to be a problem for this Eagles team throughout the season uh, unless Fangio makes major adjustments to his scheme, which he did not do against the Falcons on Monday Night Football. The Falcons had an overall success rate of 56% on their design runs in this game, uh, and that's a very good number. For those of you that are not familiar with success rates, a number that we like to use as a better measure of rushing efficiency than yards per carry because yards per carry is too often skewed by negative runs or, or, or long runs. Um and success rate is just basically judging run plays or really all plays, uh, but particularly run plays on a basically a pass fail basis, depending on the yards that you gain based off of the down and distance. Right. Uh, and so a healthy success rate is anything above 40 percent. A good success rate is over 45 percent. A very good, great success rate is over 50 percent. And like elite is 60 plus. And so the Falcons were approaching elite status. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that the Eagles refused to put extra bodies in the box. Right. According to next gen stats, they only put eight or more defenders in the box on just one play the entire game. And that, to me, that was a big reason why the Falcons were consistently able to have their way uh, on the ground. And, you know, for those that don't know, I, I believe it was Ben Baldwin. Uh, who has a website called Running Backs Don't Matter, and I think it stems from this. But he did a study several years ago to just sort of determine what's the biggest factor, the biggest variable in what determines rushing success on an individual play. And it wasn't the skill set of your running back. It wasn't the quality of your offensive line. It was how many defenders are in the box, right? That if the offense has an advantage in terms of numbers in the box, they're going to be much more likely to succeed running the football than you know not. Right. And so typically on any given run play, and it, of course it varies play to play, but typically you're going to have at least six blockers, the five offensive linemen and a tight end. And then you're going to have a running back who's going to be that seventh guy that defenses have to account for. And so defenses have to match that with seven guys. And so you can do that when you play base defense, when you typically have, you know, four guys on the line of scrimmage and, and three linebackers. Uh, to get those seven guys. But what so often teams do nowadays with 60% of NFL offenses basically running, operating out of 11 personnel or three wide receiver sets, defenses match with nickel situations. And so that's taking one of those linebackers out of the box and typically making him play cornerback. And that's why there's such an importance on, hey, your nickel cornerback has to be, you know, add some oomph in the run support and whatnot. But that often limits you to only six guys in the box. And, you know, this is going to come back when we talk about the Falcons' own run struggles uh, to stop the Eagles' ground attack uh, a little bit later. But that's going to be a challenge for you when you have that potential disadvantage where if the offense can get a hat on a hat when you have, you know, six blockers and, and six guys defending the run, you know, there's nobody that's really going to account for that running back. And so he's going to be able to carve you up. And then that's a big reason why the quarterback run game is so problematic for NFL teams, because essentially that's adding an eighth guy that defenses have to account for. And so you need to add another defender uh, in the box to deal with that. And God forbid a team has a mobile quarterback and also likes to use a fullback or tight end. And that's nine guys that you have to now account for in the box. And that's going to be hard to do as a defense. But that being all said, you know, to me, the Falcons, had a lot of success running the football in large part due to the Eagles playing with light boxes in this game and not being willing to uh, 
you know, stack the box. And, you know, I think the Falcons took advantage of that. They spanned outside zone in this game. I counted 15 outside zone runs, seven inside zone runs, one split zone, one crack toss, one jet sweep to Ray Ray McLeod in this game as their 25 design run plays. And, you know, through two games, the Falcons have overwhelmingly been an outside zone team, right? Uh, we knew that they that w- they would stick. That would be the basis, but we didn't know quite what the percentages would be. But so far, based off of my charting, uh, the staple run play of the outside zone, which is that stretch play, has accounted to about 62% of their run scheme. And I feel like that's about where they were under Arthur Smith for all three years that he was, somewhere in that high 50s, 60% range um, when it came to utilizing the outside zone run schemes. And so it reaffirms something that we talked about at the beginning of the offseason when the Falcons first hired Raheem Morris, which is that if it ain't broke, don't fix it mantra with – Raheem Morris retaining all the Falcons run game coaching staff, including offensive line coach Dwayne Ledford, who's now the run game coordinator. So he probably has a big influence on why the Falcons continue to to run the same style of offense. The assistant offensive line coach, Sean Flaherty, the running backs coach, Michael Petrie, all of those guys were there. And it's like, Hey, there's nothing wrong with this run scheme. We're just going to keep doing it. And so, you know, I wanted to see the Falcons kind of diversify things a little bit more uh, in week two, because I thought in week one, they were more effective doing that, especially as the game wore on. They started spamming outside zone early, felt like the Steelers kind of adjusted uh, their run defense. And then when the run game was effective in the second half of that game, it was either because they diversified their run plays or it was Bijan being Bijan and creating yards that weren't necessarily blocked for him. But if you're curious, the Steelers stacked the box about 38 percent of the Falcons runs. Uh, and that's been typically the norm the last couple of years for the Falcons, where 30 to 40 percent of the time. You know, teams are going to sack the box and and teams primarily play a lot of cover three against the Falcons to get that extra defender uh, in the box to play the run. And that's one of the ways that Zach Robinson's play action passing game with a lot of the crossing routes, the inbreaking stuff that you saw quite a bit of. uh, And we'll show some of those for you for the locked on Falcons inside why it can work against that style of uh, defense. And so it's it's a nice marriage offensively in that regard. But. Just wanted to point that out and how this offense can really work. But, um, you know, the Falcons, when they did diverse, they were very effective running outside zone based off my math on that stretch play, about 67% success rate. So extremely good in that regard. Their inside zone was less effective uh, when it came to that. They were only about successful in about 43% of those plays. Uh, and it, it seemed like, I think, I want to say Tyler Argier only had one or two of those plays and he was the main one that was more successful. So that's something that, you know, as the season wears on, we'll see if they kind of diversify where it's like, okay, we're going to be a little bit more willing to use Algier on some of those inside zone runs where he can kind of be that, you know, that hammer uh, and and Bijan more on the outside zone stuff. But that was part of the complaints that some people had for the Falcons run game last year because it was too predictable when it came to those types of things uh, with Algier and Bijan. So we'll see how Zach Robinson finds a balance for that. But, you know, I think you know, despite me wanting more diversity, if, if you're going to play a Vic Fangio style defense and they're really not going to make any real commitments to stopping the run, you know, then might as well just keep spamming away at what's effective. And the Falcons were able to do that. Uh, that was one of the comments I think I made to Alan yesterday on the podcast. Alan Stirk, my guest, talking about, you know, initially watching the game live, I was like, oh, they're being too conservative on second down. But then going back and watching the film and, and whatnot, I think they wound up having a 60 something, 63% success rate on second and medium or second and long runs uh, against the Eagles. And so it's just like, well, you know, typically it, basically what I'm trying to explain is like usually on like second and long, especially like you don't really want to throw the or run the football because usually, you know, it leads to third and longer than it needs to be because running is usually not an efficient way of getting yardage. But against the Eagles, it was an efficient way of getting yardage. And so even though my initial impression based off of quote unquote principles is like, Hey, don't run it as much on second and, and long as the Falcons did because of the way that the Eagles were playing. It was like, might as well. It, it's it's effective. So, um, you know, this Falcons unit is really good at outside zone. That's what they're built to be. Um, you know, that's part of the conversation to me of why, like, I'm not pushing. This is one of the best offensive lines of football. Like other people do just because I think to be that you need to be, excelling at multiple different run concepts but uh you know again if if you can just spam one thing and it's going to be as effective as it was in this game again success rate close approaching 70 percent, which is you know beyond elite you know ain't nobody gonna complain about that if you ask me so we'll see 
um, how the Falcons can continue that progress as defenses make adjustments. But uh, we'll wrap up today's episode talking about the flip side and talking about Philadelphia's rushing success and how that a lot of that was owed to the Falcons playing with light boxes. And we'll break that down as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. Guys, it's time to get back into the stadium and whether you're looking to get back for these Falcons home games as their season is back on track or you're trying to head out to, you know, wherever the Braves play. <laughs> it ain't in the city, um, you know, uh, to see them try to make this playoff push or whatever you're trying to do, whether it's sports, comedy, music, theater, whatever event is near you. Game time is taking the guesswork out of buying tickets. And we love the game time app because we get the panoramic seat view. So you know exactly what you're getting before you buy. You don't have to worry about hidden fees at checkout because they have all in prices. And of course they always have flash deals that you can always check out. Those are exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of, of whatever game or event you're looking for. And to take advantage of that, all you got to do is download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL. And you'll get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NFL. That's L O C K E D O N NFL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. So the Falcons did not have a lot of success stopping the run. And you know, as I've basically spent the, all that time explaining, you can kind of guess why. It was basically because the Eagles were very successful running against the Falcons' light boxes because, similar to the Eagles, the Falcons only stacked the box on about 14% of Saquon Barkley's uh, uh, runs, according to Next Gen Sets. That's eight or more guys in the box. That number was about 23% for Jalen Hurts, but the three plays that that would account for, I'm pretty, get, I'm pretty confident – or probably the, the three, you know, tush pushes or brotherly shoves, whatever you want to call that play uh, in those short yardage situations. And, you know, Hertz had, I think, six other design runs. If you throw that on top of Barkley's runs and the two runs of Kenneth Gainwell, basically the Falcons only stacked the box on about 10% of their plays. And I think that's directly related to why they struggled to stop the run in this game, right? In addition to, you know, not being able to prevent Jalen Hurts from scrambling, uh, where a big chunk of his yards came on that. Uh, but I went back and charted Barkley's runs, and I mentioned this with Allen talking about the difference in in terms of the Falcons, you know, defense in base versus nickel, and when the Falcons were in their nickel defense, right, uh, and so therefore more inclined, more likely to have lighter boxes. Barkley had 13 runs for 77 yards, averaging 5.9 yards a carry in an 85 percent success rate. 85%. Again, as I told you, 60% is elite. 85% is ungodly. Okay. Um, and then when the Falcons were in base defense, Barkley had nine runs for 18 yards, 2.0 yards per carry, and a 33% success rate. So the Falcons run defense was generally effective when they were playing base defense and had that extra defender in the box. And the Falcons basically were barely in base until the fourth quarter. Like basically once the Eagles took that lead midway through the fourth quarter, the rest of the game, the Falcons were like, okay, they're running out the clock. We're going to gear up. We're going to play base defense. And they were generally effective at slowing down that run game, uh, you know, in the final five minutes of that game where they were playing that base defense. And so that goes back to a comment I made on yesterday's episode to Alan Stirk when, you know, the sort of narrative coming out of the game was like, oh, the Falcons missed Nate Lemon. And I was like, I don't, I don't know if he his presence would have meant that much different. It, it probably would have impacted the game somewhat. Don't get me wrong. But I don't know if it would have been like, oh, the Falcons run defense would have been great if Nate Lamon had played. Because, you know, as I mentioned on last week's All-22 review in the Steeler game, uh, the Falcons played Nate Lamon exclusively in base de- or not almost exclusively in base defense, like, all, but like two plays. Uh, and, and Troy Anderson in nickel, uh, basically, whenever the Falcons and the Falcons were predominantly in nickel in this game quite a bit, especially on the run plays, uh, because, you know, Philadelphia was playing a lot of 11 personnel, three wide receiver sets. And so that meant that the Falcons had a lot of six man boxes and Philly, because of the five offensive linemen and tight end consistently were able to get six blockers and they were consistently able to get a hat on the hat. Uh, and despite the Falcons playing a lot of cover three, which is their preferred uh, coverage, um, you know, what they tend to do is they present too high pre-snap. And so then they, that safety rotates late into the uh, box to, to come downhill. And that's kind of a give or take because that style makes you more effective defending the pass. But I think it does open up vulnerabilities 
to the run, not to mention that the Falcon safeties aren't really ideal. They don't really have a safety that's ideally suited to be that thumper, that enforcer against the run, right? With Justin Simmons, Jesse Bates, Richie Grant, and, and Micah Abernathy are, are, are not really those types of guys. That's where we can have a conversation about, you know, games like this is where the Falcons miss a player like DeMarco Hellams, where having a player like him who can be more of that enforcer could have benefited their uh, defense a lot more. So I, I would argue probably just as much as Nate Landman was missed, DeMarco Hellams was missed in this game, if not arguably more. But, you know, when the Falcons did the handful of times, like that 15% when the Falcons did have success stopping the run with their nickel fronts, it was mostly due to them penetrating, right? And a lot of that came from Grady Jarrett. You had Matthew Judon knifing in the backfield to get one TFL in this game, tackle for loss. Um, and so that goes back to a comment you've heard me say many times on this podcast over the years, like with defense, it's less about the X's and O's and it's more about the Jimmy's and Joe's. There really isn't a perfect defense. Every defense has its vulnerability. And yeah, the nickel is going to give you an advantage theoretically uh, in terms of pass coverage and the way that the Falcons are going to play, you know, with their pre-snap and post-snap rotations are going to give you advantage in pass coverage, but it does potentially open you up for a lot more, you know, vulnerabilities against the run. And so we'll see what adjustments the Falcons made. You know, and again, I think another factor that is not nearly to the degree that the Eagles have, but the Falcons do are playing with lighter bodies this year up front as well, uh, especially at the edges. And, and that's why if you're one of these people that's wondering, like, why are is James Smith Williams and Lorenzo Carter getting more snaps than Arnold Piketty and D'Angelo Malone? It's directly related to that. Right. That you you want the bigger bodies up front to help stop the run. Clearly, that didn't solve the problem this week. But I do think over time that's going to you're going to get more value from the two veteran guys and, and the two heavier guys, more physical guys and Smith Williams and Lorenzo Carter uh, long term than you will with AK and D'Angelo Malone. And that's going to be a limiting factor. And we talked about this with this most recent draft class where like everybody focuses on the pass rush. Right? We talked about this with Brandon Dorless specifically. Everybody focuses on the pass rush and, and the potential there, but they forget that, you know, especially at this stage in your career, like you're not going to be able to get on the field to develop that pass rush if you can't defend the run. But uh, we'll see how that develops. But um, overall, I will say, you know, to wrap up this conversation about the Falcons run defense, I don't think the Falcons front has lived up to the hype so far through two games this year. Right. They haven't been great stopping the run. They haven't been great rushing the quarterback. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the conversations I could have had instead of talking about the run game is talking about the Falcons lack of pass rushing success against Philadelphia. And when they did get success, a lot of it was manufactured. A lot of it was coverage sacks, a lot of it or coverage pressures or stunts and whatnot. Um, and again, Philadelphia's offensive line, you know, they hit legitimately have a top five offensive line because, um, you know, they, they can run all types of things uh, and also be an elite pass blocking unit. Uh, unlike the Falcons, Falcons offensive line looked very good this week, but isn't quite on that level. They, they still got to prove whether or not they're in the conversation with a team like Philadelphia. Um, but, you know, because Philadelphia's offensive line is, is so good, I'm not going to necessarily kill them for that. But as Alan mentioned on yesterday's episode, you got another really good offensive line, at least interior offensive line. And so you need your edges to really step up this week as far as the pass rush goes. So this will be a golden opportunity for that defensive front to change the narrative, as we have discussed so often over the last week. So we need to see the front step up. I think the secondary in general has done their job and, and is playing good football. Uh, but, you know, we need that front, especially next week to step up, especially that pass rush to step up because there is a buzzsaw coming to town and his name is Patrick Mahomes. And if you can't get pressure on that guy, you know, the, the numbers are saying that he's going to complete 75, 80% of his passes. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck, my guys. <laughs> so good luck. So we'll see if the pass rush can step up. You know, we'll talk more about that potential buzzsaw on your next episode of Lockdown Falcons, which will be airing uh, probably later today or whenever you listen to this podcast. That's your next episode of Crossover Thursday, where I'll be joined by Lockdown Chiefs to talk about this upcoming matchup. So go check that out by subscribing to Lockdown Falcons on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, and of course, make sure you hit that link in the description at Lockdown Falcons Insiders, join subtext.com slash Lockdown Falcons, and you'll get plays video of these play action passes the falcons rushing success as well as their run defensive woes it's all available uh and that link in the description below 14 day free trial then 4.99 a month after that point so go check it out guys and make sure you check out locked on chiefs locked on nfl locked on sports atlanta all the shows it's all part of locked on podcast network your team every day